not standing here if they are. So it's lovely to be back and uh, to come to this area. You know, it's it's not an area I know well. And you know, I know you have to suffer up here. You know, you're starved of decent football and you know other things like that. And uh, that's made me at least two enemies in the congregation. But there we go. Um, nice to be back in the in the land of the northeast and uh, to be to be part of this um, weekend with you. And uh, I don't know about you, but don't you think that these days we live in a bit of a a shaky world? Yeah, uh, is that would that be generally agreed around? You know, we're not quite sure where we're going, are we? Many values are being dumped. Things that we hold dear, things which we think are important. Uh, many of us maybe feel we need a, a tonic, a pick me up, uh, something to get us going again. You know, from some of the things we've been through. Uh, I've had COVID three times. I don't know if that's a world record, but you know, um, I suppose it's one of the pains of ministry. So I've I've had it, and it's not funny. Um, and, uh, you know, there are various things about life that just, I don't know, hard work, isn't it, these days? So uh, I want to try, if I can, uh, to encourage you because our, our society runs largely, our, our country largely runs on secular values. It, it's based on, on secular thinking nowadays. Now, there are some vestiges of Christian values left here and there. Some, many of our laws are based on the Ten Commandments. Uh, some of them aren't, by the way, um, and that's, that's a sort of mixed thing. And I think that statement at the end of Judges pretty well sums up uh, what, what we're on about these days. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Seems to kind of fit our world quite well. Uh, and then I got thinking about um, a visit. I used to go to Israel a lot. I'm not going there at the moment. It's not a nice place to be, is it? Um, but I took about seven trips to Israel. And uh, I always remember one. We went to a place on the side of the Sea of Galilee. And there they have a little chapel, which is dedicated to the, the Beatitudes. Jesus, Matthew 5, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, I read this to my group. And uh, my Jewish guide, who I love working with, Michael, he was called, tank commander, interesting man. Um, as we walked off the Mount of Beatitudes, he grabbed my arm. And I thought, what was that? I thought I was being attacked or something. And he said, Dave, he said, that passage you just read. I said, yeah, Matthew 5. It's one of Jesus' statements. And, and he said, you know, if you Christians lived that, you'd change the world. If you Christians lived that, you'd change the world. If we learned what it meant to be poor in spirit... That doesn't mean to say we're sort of, you know, meek and mild and horrible. Poor in spirit means that we're poor in spirit and we depend entirely on our God. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourning people are people who are mourning for the state of our world. They look at the world and just as Jesus did, they weep. And he said, if, if, you, if you got hold of this, uh, and we had this conversation, I, I must confess, it was over a beer on the side of the Sea of Galilee. You know, I thought I'd mention that just to confess something, you know, you know I was human. You know, and, and we just sat there till about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and he, he wanted me to unpack the Beatitudes. He said, tell me what they really mean, Dave. Tell me what they really mean. And he was so keen to learn. And as uh, I reflect on today and, and the world that we live in, it, it drives me back to one thought. It drives me back to the thought that we as Christians, and not just we as Christians, but the world that we live in, need Jesus. We need to know Jesus. We need to know him better. Now that does not mean we need to come to church more often. It means that we've got to build our understanding, our relationship with, our understanding of his teaching, of why he came, and if we got to know Jesus better, if we were more rested in Jesus, that's a good Old Testament word, isn't it? A good rest in Jesus. If we, if we relied on him, if we turned to him, if we said, what would Jesus think? If we, if we focused everything, if, as it were, if we put Jesus' glasses on and looked at the world through Jesus' glasses, what, what would that look like? And you see, I think it's our duty as Christians gathered here today uh, to try and get both to get to know him better ourselves 
but to make him known. Uh, We have to ask if we as church people have bottled him up. Have we kept him here? And if we let Jesus loose on the world and we challenged people with the kind of teaching that I was just mentioning from the Beatitudes, would people be attracted? Would that person across your fence in your next garden be saying, if you talk like that, I, I want to know more about this Jesus person. So who is Jesus? What is he in the 21st century? You see, I, I think of a man like Andrew White. Have you heard of Andrew White? He's the vicar of Baghdad. You say, what? Vicar of Baghdad? That sounds like a contradiction in terms. No, he is the vicar of Baghdad. He has MS. He speaks in a, in a, a way that sometimes quite... In fact, when I first saw him, I thought he was drunk because he speaks that way because of his MS. That guy walks around Baghdad with a bullet vest on. And he talks to people about Jesus. Now, Baghdad's not a pretty place. You know, he's several times he's had stuff chucked through his windows of his church and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, but he's there and he's a faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ in a city like Baghdad? What's that about? He's passionate about Jesus. So my plan for these two days is, one, to get to know who Jesus is, and then tomorrow morning we'll see how that affects our lives. Because you see, in, in any act, forgive me if this is obvious, but I think it needs stating. In any activity we do as believers, we should do it with our focus on Jesus, on Jesus Christ, on the Lord Jesus Christ. We focus on him. He is the reason for our life. He is the way we look at things. It is Jesus that rules. He is the king. And it's him that we acknowledge as Lord over all our lives. So when I play golf, and it had to get a mention sometime, didn't it? Come on, give me a break. Um, When I play golf, he's the king of that. Now that means because I sink every putt from 20 feet away. No, of course it doesn't. That's nonsense. But it does mean that when I do sink one and somebody says to me, Dave, you must have been on your prayer mat this morning. I said, why don't you join me at the 19th hole? And we'll have a chat. Because that gives me an an opportunity to say to that guy who gave me that wisecrack, I want to tell you about Jesus. Because Jesus is the reason for my life. That's why I've got three funerals booked for three members of my golf club who say they want me to do the service. Because I've shared Jesus with all of them and they want to know more. And why I have the privilege of praying with two of their wives because they're terminally ill. Because, and I'm not saying I'm brilliant at this, by any means I'm not. But Jesus has, if you like, infiltrated the way I think and live. He's infiltrated the way I play golf, actually. Which means I'm, of course, only destined to win the Open next year. Uh, If only that was true. And it's that headship that we must acknowledge, and, and it's, it's to him that we serve. It's, we focus on him, on who he is, on what he's done. And in Colossians 1, Paul gives us one of the great statements about Jesus Christ. And I want to read it to you, if I may, if you have your Bibles handy. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read the whole chapter pretty well, but um, the bit in the middle is the one I'm really interested in looking at with you. So let's go back to the beginning, first one, and let me read it to you. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard about it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf 
and have also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May God help us to understand that and apply it to our lives. Now, Colossae is interesting stuck up a valley called the Lycus Valley. Paul never went there, never traveled to it, as far as we're aware. No journey was ever made. He used Epaphras, the name that was mentioned there, uh, to be, as it were, his, his regent in, in Colossae. He was the man that was clearly running the church there. And, and so we have this picture of a, of a church, and, and notice that first bit, which I'm going to skip over very quickly. Uh, it's, it's all about what their lives are going to be like and what Paul is saying there is you you will live fruitful lives you will go on with God you will bear fruit as it says you will go on being that because of the gospel that's been planted in you because of your life in Jesus that is what will make the difference in your church and therefore in the society that you inhabit you see this doesn't stay in church it can't stay in church it's got to spill off it's got to spill out it's got to affect the networks we live in. And you all have your networks, your people that you know, people that you meet each day, each week. And, and what Paul is saying here is that you may have this, uh, this wonderful inheritance. You will have that if you're a faithful servant and you, you do your best. Now, God isn't asking you to take on the whole world. God is asking you to do what you can where you are. Just to spill that little bit of gospel truth around just to spread that little bit of light where you can. Uh, I once vividly remember going into Sainsbury's. I do occasionally, uh, where my wife directs me. I did once come home with, um, what was it? Um, good afternoon, bird. Uh, I, came, I, I was told to get sultanas, and I came home with satsumas. Can you believe I did that? Um, but that's, that was me and my ignorance. Um, and uh, I went in, I, I sometimes wear these funny collars, you know, dog collars, they call them, don't they? And I had this on, and I walked into, and... Uh, this woman said to me uh, on the till, she was tilling away my endless purchases, and she said, are you one of them? So I thought, that's not a very nice thing to say to a bloke with a collar on. So I said, if you mean am I a clergyman, yeah, I am. Oh, she says, you are. So I said, well, yeah, why don't you come and join us one night? And I, it was one of those, you know, you know, I then bought me satsumas or something, I can't remember which one it was there, and, and I bought it and, and I was off. She turns up to church following Sunday. 
I meet her every Sunday now. She's still with us. And that was because she made a slightly facetious comment to me and I made an equally facetious comment back to her. And she's now with the, with the Lord. She's been baptized as a believer. You see, you have somebody, you have something somewhere which you could possibly share. Because what Paul is doing in this chapter, he's talking about, first of all, in verses 15 to 17, he's talking about Jesus being the mediator of, of creation. He is the authority of the world in which we live. That is what he is. This world is his. Now, we may think it's being controlled by some people that are doing some pretty chronic damage, um, but, but it's still the fact that he is Lord. In verse 18 to 20, he talks about the church and the fact that Jesus is the head of the church. And then in 21 to 23, about the finished work of Christ. All of those three things are important because, friends, he is, he is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient. Now, we need all the things that are in our world, but he is all sufficient for our need. In whatever state the world is in, however foul Gaza and Israel is at the moment, he is sufficient. His universal supremacy guarantees that Christ is all in all. If we follow him, we lack nothing. And you see, I, I think we get to places where we start to say things like, um, yeah, but, but I've got to run the rest of my life. I thought I was going to get shot then for a minute. No, but just try and ignore it if you can. I know it's distracting, but just keep going. Um, we can easily get to the place where, yeah, I've got a God part of my life over here, but I've got the real world that I've got to live in. And, and therefore, we, we actually have to say that that is not right. Because he is Lord of all. He's Lord of your shopping. He's Lord of your neighborhood. He's Lord of this created world that we live in. He is Lord of Gaza. He is Lord. Now let's take this apart a little bit more, shall we? In verses 15 to 17 we read, He is the image of the invisible God. Um, you know, I think it's awfully possible for us um, to think of Jesus just as a, a really good bloke who turned up one day in the world. Now, the, the Bible doesn't define him that way. And we need, uh, you probably heard, some of you heard this a million times before, but we need to, to resharpen this, I think, in these days. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, the way the Bible defines that, um, and it's written at a time when this sort of phrase was often used in Greek philosophy, he is the image of the reality. It is that reality. He is that reality of God. The Jesus that walked on this earth is the exact reality of God in every sense. So Christ is an exact visible rep uh, representation of the God we cannot see. Romans 1.20 Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, like his eternal power, have been clearly seen. It is clear when Christ comes. He brings clarity. Now, can I lovingly suggest that in these days, when you've watched your six o'clock news and you're thinking, oh boy, what else is going to go wrong? Get your Bible open and read Colossians 1 or read a story about Jesus and remind yourself who he is. He is the image of the eternal God. As a friend of mine once called him, God in a body. You, you must never drop Jesus below that level. Now, yes, in every sense he is human. He had flesh and blood and body just like I have and you have. But he is the image of the eternal God. And we see who God is, creator and savior. We see what God is like, a God of mercy and love. And to see what God does, one who sends his son to save his people from their sin. That's what we see. A beautiful, perfect God person on our planet. 
And he's a historical figure. I occasionally encounter students or young people who say, well, you know, he's a myth. Well, um, I, I have been known to use the phrase, what a load of rhubarb, frankly. Because, <sighs> read your history book. Go to Israel and look at all the dates on the walls. C-E, B-C-E. They don't say B-C and A-D like we do. And C-E is the common era. And B.C.E. is before the common era, the common era of Judaism and Christianity. Any self-respecting Jew knows that Jesus was a reality. He was a real person. He lived. So if you hear that kind of myth stuff, um, tell them to go to the Museum of Antiquities in Israel, if they've got a minute, um, and just see the evidence. He is real. So he's also the firstborn over all creation. Now this may tempt you to say that Jesus was the first person born. That's not what Paul's saying. In the Old Testament, this title expresses that the title of bestowed on Israel, the firstborn, a title of sovereignty, because he'd been chosen by God. He is a, he is a sovereign God. Jesus is sovereign. So the firstborn idea marks him out as different to all created things. He is before them in time. Guys, this is brilliant, isn't it? Just get excited. He created that bird. Yeah? What an amazing God. But he was before it. Or his ancestors. Or They've probably got ancestors, you know. He was before everything. Bethlehem wasn't the beginning. That's why we use the word incarnate rather than born. He was incarnate of the Virgin Mary. Yes, she gave birth in the way that all you mums gave birth. But that was God planting the son who pre-existed creation. Hey, isn't, this is getting a bit big. It, it, it should do. He was there before creation. Ephesians tells us that. that. He was there before the creation of the world. That is Jesus who walked from Bethlehem and Nazareth and Jerusalem and hung on a cross with nails in his hands. And the Jesus who says he wants a relationship with you because he loves you. He pre-existed creation. And you tell me you can't trust him. Well, you don't trust him enough. Well, all things were created by him, Paul says here. Now, created is... Um, you love that word, created. It's great, isn't it? Now, I, I'm not known for my DIY excellence. There is a famous room in our house, and you, I'm never going to invite you because it's embarrassing, where a curtain rail goes like that. We, we don't have to draw our curtains. They just fall naturally open by themselves, you know, because of the way I put it up. It's absolute rubbish. It really is. Now, that isn't creation. Creation is something, and I'm going to use a bit of Latin here. Do you do Latin up here? Yeah. Ex nihilo. Do you like that? From nothing. You try it when you get home. When you get in your kitchen, let there be a cake. And see if you get one on your worktop. Unlikely. When you make a table, you go and buy wood. You make a table from the wood you buy and the screws and the glue and all the... Shows my ignorance what I'm saying here, does it? You know, all that stuff. God created... Jesus, the Word, created from nothing, ex nihilo. Let there be, and there was. Let there be birds. Let there be giraffes. Let there be snakes, even. Or even let there be wasps. That's God's big mistake in my book, but there you go. I don't mean that, by the way. That's heresy. Um, from nothing he created the order and he just put it in place now couple this with what you'll be reading in a few weeks time the word the word that created you know what I'm going to say next don't you John 1.14 became flesh flesh this Jesus that we follow was the created order word person who then became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory full of grace and truth. Is Jesus getting a bit bigger for you at the moment? 
I really hope so. He is the true origin of creation. Without him, it has no meaning. The world depended on the Lord Jesus for its beginning, its continuation, and its finality. As one commentator put it, he keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. He puts it in that way. But we must never look upon God as a good maintenance mechanic of our world. Another commentator said, he is its rationale, its rhyme, and its reason. The universe is not self-sufficient, nor are people, however much that is valued as a modern quality. But what God did was bring about a world of incredible beauty. Now, what impact does that have on our 21st century world? If Christ is the supreme figure of creation, what difference does that make? As one little boy said in a classroom, if Jesus came back today, could he handle the internet? He is still the Lord of our world. Even though many of us live with, understand, read about, scientific invention, medical science with all its wonderful advances, and the fact that we can clone animals, we can engineer genes, he is still the Lord of that creation. The Bible doesn't deny man's creativity, man's ability to think things out and make things which are, are breathtaking in their brilliance. And only when people realize that Christ is the force behind creation, both its origin and its continuity, will we ever make sense of the world we live in. If we ignore God in our world, we commit the sin of Babel. We say we're bigger than God. We have authority. You see, Christ is the key to understanding our world. He is the way we should look at the world. Against a backdrop of suffering, God offers a pain-free eternity. Faced with terminal illness, God says death is not the end. Do you see it? Do you see the fact that Jesus has authority means that those things which blow our brains out, that when men decide to fly airplanes into tall buildings, God will judge such people who do that. They will not get away scot-free. Because... Because this God, in, in the form of Jesus, says that I am still in control of the world. And when you look, and I'll probably say this again tomorrow morning, but I'll say it now in case you're not here. Um, when we look at Gaza, do you sometimes turn the telly off and say, oh dear, why are these Israelis doing that? Why did Hamas do what they did? Why did that happen? Why is this happening? And some dear saint of mine in, in my own church said to me the other day, Dave, he said, just, just put your Jesus glasses on. What would Jesus do if he walked into that hospital? You know the one I'm talking about. I think the first thing he'd have done would weep. Jesus did weep. There's a chapel on the Mount of Olives to commemorate it. Dominus flavit, second bit of Latin, Jesus wept. And then he would look where he could care. Where could he help somebody? How could he help that little child the other day who screamed at the television camera, but I haven't done anything wrong? And I, I'm encouraging you to look at the world through Jesus' eyes. It's very easy to get angry, and to some degree angry, angry and that anger in that situation is valid. But, but I think what Jesus is saying to us, friends, look at it as I would look at it, and get on your knees and pray that this rubbish would end. And meanwhile, help me to pray specifically. Turn your news off, think of the people you've seen, and pray for them. Pray for that surgeon 
desperate to try and do plastic surgery on, on people whose bodies have been mutilated. Pray that that guy will have skill to do it well. For the mothers of babies who have been whipped out of incubators and laid on a big table. Did you see that? My friends, the number of times that Jesus had compassion, you see, that changes. The fact that Jesus is, is making us think differently, it, it changes the way we look at so many situations. Rather than getting angry, we look at it through the compassionate eyes of Jesus because he is the one who has put these things in place. He has created and, and he's put something very beautiful in place by his creation. You see, we should be the environmentalists. We should be it. Because did you know you're a gamekeeper? Did you know that? You're a gamekeeper. That's lit, almost literally the word. Steward is the word used sometimes in some translations. But God says, will you steward my world? Will you look after it? Now, I then look at situations like Israel and I say, what can I do to look after that? Not a lot, really. But I can certainly pray and if, there's, if there are some Christians working there that I could support, well, I'll support them. And my wife has a wonderful practice. Bless her heart. She, she's on the internet sort of finding places. She was one waving a placard when Asher Bibi was in prison. She went up to London and waved it around. Because she said, that's where Christians should be. And when we look at the, the environment that we live in, we are to care for it. Now, that's great if you collect yogurt pots and scrap paper and all the rest of it. That's fantastic. Do it. Keep it going. Don't, don't stop doing it. But if we geared our whole houses to creation care, I'm not plugging the environmentalists. I'm plugging the fact that God told, it, told me to look after the world he put me in. And I think that's a serious issue. One of our staff at church recently is, um, she's a very brave lass. She's a student worker, so she's, she's got to look trendy, you know. Um, so she's come out and said, I don't buy any new clothes. I'm getting them all from charity shops because they don't want old clothes to go into landfill. And Louise, bless her, is, is keeping up to it. And she looks smashing. She got a great jumper on the other day. She said, I got this for three quid at a charity shop. And she looks great. Now I think we Christians should be the example setters here. Because of the fact that God created the world and that through Jesus' eyes looks different to when we look at it just from our own consumerist eyes. Do you see it? Anyway, let me move on. Let's do the church bit. 18 to 20. Here, Paul brings the cosmic creator Christ into the realm of the earth. Paul places the supreme person of, of Christ into salvation history. He came, he says. He is the head of his body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn among the dead, that in everything he might have the supremacy. Christ is the head of the church. And uh, we, we know that because that's what the Bible clearly teaches us here. The church is here to fulfill God's purpose, his saving purposes for the world he made through the preaching of the gospel and living in a way that honors God. That's what we're here to do. Living in a way that honors God is not easy, is it? But he is the head of the church, which means that he has supreme authority here in this place, just as in my own church, and he is the source of its life. Friends, we come here to meet with Jesus. That's why we come to church. Now we come to, you know, something really shocked me when I came here once, you lot. You really, I went home hurt, I will be honest, because I didn't get a Christmas card. And you all came, and you were exchanging Christmas cards all around the place, and uh, I didn't get any. Now I hope that will be redeemed this Christmas, you know, with lots of Christmas cards arriving on my, on my doorstep, that would be really nice. Um, but yeah, you were all doing it, so you were showing that love, living together. But... If it means that we are his church, then, then we are to get that news out. Now, this is not meant to be a guilt trip, and I won't make it such. But I, I think a little word here and there, a little chance to gossip Jesus, a little chance to just sort of commend, you know. I was at church yesterday. No, I didn't 
I don't say that. I never say that to people. I say, I went to worship Jesus. And some of you go, ooh, write that. But I never say I go to church. Because that's institutional. And my faith is relational. I hope yours is too. So I went to meet Jesus. Now, that's what I mean by getting Jesus out of the bottle. Getting him known. Getting him talked about. Because he is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, it says, doesn't it? Um, Christ's resurrection is the source of life. Because I live, you will also live, he says in John 14, verse 19. And the goal of resurrection, do you see it? Was to not just give people a hope for the future, but then everything, he might have the supremacy. Ultimately, Jesus will rule over all. He will have the supremacy. He will be the king who rules. And I just want to get a few more subjects into his kingdom. If we can, do what we can. Christ's death and resurrection. The firstborn he is, that there will be others. Are you looking forward to that? The answer to that should have been yes, but I didn't get many. But, you know, I live in hope. Um, but but that's, that's it, isn't it? But the wonderful thought, do you ever think of it? I mean, I'm ancient now. I'm positively ancient. But I'm looking forward to it. I want to see Jesus. I've got some questions for Martin Luther. That's the first guy I'm going to find in heaven. You know, sort him out and t- tell me why he did certain things in the Reformation. But that will be a very interesting conversation. If he's got time for me, I'll have a chat with him. You know, and, and this, are you looking forward to gathering around the throne of, of the Lord Jesus and being in his presence? Now, not just yet, maybe. Stick around for a... Come tomorrow morning or we won't have a congregation. Uh, but, th- but the idea that one day, with Christ forever, Paul says it far better. But then he expresses the frustration, Romans 70. He says, but I, I've still got things to do here and I don't wish his best. And that's the tension we live in. Do what you can while you're on planet Earth. Because one day, there will be the wonderful assurance of resurrection. He is the firstborn from among the dead. We will follow on. We will be there. Now you see, that, for me, paints a whole different complexion on living in this world. Because it's now, and and for a season, maybe sometime soon, maybe sometime, I don't know when, I will be there. I will be there with him. And so will you. Are you ready for that? To surrender to the king of the universe and say, one day I'll be there. Well, that's how it is. Because he is, verse 9, the fullness of God. In Christ, all the fullness of God dwells. And he, verse 20, let's move on a bit, is the one who reconciles. Sin defiled creation. The universe is crooked because of its sin. There's no great kingly action that resolved it all. It was just a shameful death on a Roman cross when blood was shed. And that means you and I have hope for eternity. And, and we've got to live like that. So when we look at Gaza, we pray like crazy that somewhere in amongst that dreadful situation, the gospel will be heard by somebody popping up and talking about it. And the, the effects of sin will be dealt with. Once you were alienated from God, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. And there we have one of the ultimate statements about the work of Christ. That that Jesus who we've studied and talked about all afternoon will be the means of reconciling you and I to a God who is so holy he cannot look on sin. But as Psalm 32 says, blessed is the man whose sin is covered. And if you know the Lord Jesus, your sin is covered. And you will be with him forever. That's Jesus. That makes a difference to the world we live in. The Jesus of the 21st century. Get to know him. Read about him. Think about him. Talk about him. 
Have moments where you reflect on him. Get to know him better. Because my friends, if you Christians live that, you change the world. Let's change your little bit of it. My little bit of it. And hopefully we will see fruit for our labors. Can I pray? And then we must go on our merry way. Let's pray together. God our Father, please will you help us to know Jesus better. Will you help us understand who he is? Help us understand how brilliant he is. How it behoves us to get to know him better. To talk about him on the streets. To talk about him in our homes. To talk about him when we meet together. To focus on the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person of Jesus. And to remember that it was he who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we might have life and life eternal. Despite what we're facing with illness or pressure or famine or whatever we're facing in our world. That anybody who knows the Lord Jesus has hope. Wonderful, wonderful hope. Teach us, we pray, about the person of Jesus. Amen.